Latinos. And the organizers asked me to remind everyone that there are masks available out in front and there's hand sanitizer and to please wash your hands, you know, try to keep your distance. And if anyone has any symptoms to please, please isolate yourself. Don't come to the meeting. Don't be in close contact with people here. And also to let the organizers know because, and it will all be kept confidentially, or kept anonymous and confidential. But we just want to monitor the situation. Okay, and Anita's gonna translate all that. Thank you. Hola. Bueno, just in case, it's, uh, I will say it in Spanish que una persona en la conferencia contrajo COVID y por lo tanto eh, les recordamos que, que es bueno la, higienizarse las manos frecuentemente, hay alcohol allí que pueden utilizar y máscaras que dejamos para que retiren. Yo sé que hace muchísimo calor y es muy difícil estar enmascarado eh, en esta situación, nos pasa a todos, pero si alguien tiene síntomas o demás, que por favor se aísle inmediatamente que nos avisen y, y eso, bueno, a cuidarse. Eh, muchas gracias. And also because not everyone's here, please spread this around, spread it around <laughs> through your voice. Let everyone know. I forgot to say something. De que no vamos a dar el nombre de las personas o sea, así que eh, va a ser anónimo. Gracias. Oh, yes. Okay, great. So I'm really happy today to introduce Dr. Ava Turk. Uh, Ava did her undergrad in biology at the University of Ljubljana, and then she went on to receive her master's degree in primate evolution at the University College of London. And very recently, she received her doctorate, her doctorate at the Research Center of the Slovenia Academy of Sciences and Arts. And this was under the supervision of Matyaj Kutner. And the focus of her uh, doctorate research was biogeography, diversification, population genetics, and gold in the golden orb weaver spiders. And presently, she is a bioinformatician at the National Institute of Biology in Ljubljana. And today, she's going to be talking to us about biogeography and phylogeography in golden orb weavers. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak as a uh, young researcher and um, Spanish speaker. Um, so, uh, yeah, so then I'm going to speak about uh, first uh, historical biogeography and then phylogeography in golden or river spiders. Um, so, the first thing um, I'm going to, um, I'm, I'm just going to say a few things about the spiders themselves. Um, the, these spiders, this group of spiders, is uh, treated as at either the familiar or at the subfamilial level in, in the literature. So um, I just want to say that in this talk, I'm going to refer to them at the family level, so as nephews. So um, this is a group of spiders that um, exhibits. Uh, it's a very well-known, conspicuous group of spiders. Um, it exhibits several intriguing features. And the most prominent among them has to be their sexual size dimorphism. Um, it can be extreme in some cases. For example, in the photo on the left, um, you can see the, the tiny orange male sitting, sitting on top of the huge um, gigantic female. Um, they also build large asymmetric uh, webs. Um, they have a golden sheen, which is actually what gives them their, their common name. So their um, accent distribution is wide. Uh, they inhabit <coughs> the tropics and subtropics around the world, um, with only a few species, most notably the Asian um, Trypanophila clavata here on the right, extending into the into more temperate regions. Um, and so, because of this um, wide um, wide distribution, we were, we were wondering um, in the first um, in the first part of this. A study where in the world these uh, guys originated from. And so we had two competing, um, maybe two possible hypotheses regarding the origin. Uh, the first returned out of Africa. 
So um, um, Africa, the continent, hosts the largest um, extant diversity of methods, which um, then might be um, some indication of the Afrotropics being the ancestral um, um, geographical area. And then the other hypothesis we termed out of West Burma. And this one kind of um, relies on the assumption that uh, the, the fossilized uh, spider called Gratonephila from Vermisamber is in fact a stem nephila. So this Vermisamber is found on a small um, tectonic fragment called the West Burma block. And the geological past of this um, tectonic fragment is not exactly well known. But um, it is assumed that it broke off from the um, Australasian plate and then either routed towards its present location on its own or attached to the Indian plate. So, this is why um, to find support for this hypothesis, either Australasia or Indo Malaya or both um, should be reconstructed as the ancestral area. Um, so, in the beginning, of course, we need a, a phylogeny. Um, here we, we um, further expanded the best supported phylogeny to date, the one on the left, by adding two, um, sorry, three species from the genus Herenia, which has, which have pre previously not been placed phylogenetically. So this basically brought up um, the taxon sampling of the family to 85%. And here you can also um, note the age of the whole clade, which is uh, very old. It's, over, it's estimated to about 130 million years. So, um, because their present distribution is so wide, we uh, divided it into seven um, biogeographic uh, uh, ranges. Six of them directly correspond to the well-established, uh, well-known biogeographical realms. And then we added West Indian Ocean as a separate um, area due to very high levels of endemism of naturalists in this, in this area. Um, so these types of analysis, biogeographic analysis, um, allow us to specify um, different probabilities of dispersal between each pair of biogeographic region um, per a specific time slice. So this is something that is um, done commonly in biogeographic analysis. However, um, these different uh, dispersal estimations are usually arbitrary but we wanted to base them on something concrete or so something measurable, and we decided to use the physical distances between pairs of land masses in each 10 million year time slice as a proxy for the probability, for probability of dispersal. Um, so after, after um, incorporating this into the analysis, this was the best supported result. So it's not a very you can't really read it, uh, I won't go into details anyway, but the main um, takeaway message here was the, the origin, so the base of most um, um, note was reconstructed to be in both um, Indo Malaya and Australasia, so a joint distribution in both areas. And then also we, uh, we can see that in some parts of the phylogeny, for example, the genus Herenia Afanta, um, this virus seems, seems to have persisted in the same geographical um, area for tens of millions of years, while in others, for example, in Trichonephila here at the, at the bottom, um, they seem to have um, moved, moved around a lot, so a lot of different dispersal um, events. And we depicted a few of the more interesting dispersal events in this uh, figure here. I'm only going to talk about one um, in panel B. Um, there is um, there's a, a depiction of a dispersal event within the genus Triconatula um, at about 50 million years ago from um, Australasia to the Neotropics via, of course, Antarctica. And this might seem a bit um, strange looking at it now, but of course, this was the time of the Paleocene in the thermal maximum. The poles of the Earth were ice free, so it was, um, and the, the Drake passage between Antarctica and South America was still closed. So, of course, this was not only a possible dispersal route, but one that has been uh, reconstructed in several other organisms, animals, and plants. Um, this is the paper that includes the study, if anyone would like to um, maybe read on the methodology. And last year, me and Matias also posted, um, sorry, um, um, published a, a paper where we argued that um, a, both abiotic and biotic factors which 
potentially have an influence on this person's ability or this person's probability should um, try to be incorporated in this sort of biogeographical reconstructions. Um, and so for the second part, we looked at the phylogeography at the, at the species level. The main idea that we wanted to test here was whether um, low population level genetic structure is indeed fa found in highly dispersive taxa, like, like, like it should be. Um, and within Golden Oak Weavers, one species that is definitely known to be a great disperser, and that is Nephilopinipus, also known as the giant Golden Oak Weaver. Um, this is one of the most um, sexually uh, dimorphic species of all spiders. Um, it inhabits low elevation rainforests um, throughout Asia and, and Australia. Um, so these climates are seasonal, and the animals themselves are, are solitary. So here, as I said, ballooning is definitely present. It is frequent. Um, and then as a, as, as a contrast to, to Nephilopilipus, we, we chose another species which differs from it both in the environment it inhabits, it, it, it inhabits and uh, its um, uh, life history traits. So we decided to go for uh, Nephila clavata, also known as the dwarf spider, um, which is a much smaller, less than one species. It is the one that I um, said before is the only one with a truly uh, temperate um, distribution. And so these, these uh, habitats are, are seasonal. Um, they exhibit large fluctuations in, in environmental conditions. And also this species um, aggregates into loose colonies. So the main two aims of the study were firstly to see whether any genetic stru structure would be found in either of these species and whether any differences between these two structures might be explained in the context of um, the discrepancies in their life histories and the environment. And then we also have two additional aims, uh, one for each um, region of the species. In Nephilopilipus, um, and we can find in nature a very melanic uh, females, so females with black abdomens and reddish legs. And it has been proposed that these are, in fact, um, a, a separate species called uh, Nephila queen. So I wanted to use our data set to check whether we could find any indication that those are indeed uh, a separate species or not. And then in uh, the Jorah spider, the aim was quite different. Um, this species has actually been reported um, in the US for the first time in 2015. And since then, it has been spreading uh, quite rapidly. There's actually a website now which allows, um, which uh, through citizen science actually monitors the gradual spread of the species. And we're wondering whether we could get any insights into which um, Asian populations these, these American ones um, came from. So we had um, 94. We have 94 samples of Nephila filipus and 40 of Trichonephila clavata. These samples were, were mostly, um, mostly collected from existing collections from Slovenia and from Taiwan. And then we also had five specimens of Trichonephila clavata from, from Georgia. Um, and, the, and the genetic uh, method used here was restriction site associated sequencing um, targeting uh, these NIPs. So, um, so these results are all preliminary, it's, it's an ongoing study, we're still, we're still working on this, but uh, for Trichonephila clavata, there is no um, genetic structure shown here because none was found. Um, it turns out that all the included um, individuals seem to be extremely um, genetically homogenous, which was definitely a surprise to us. And also uh, looking at the, um, the phylogeny on the left, um, Samples that were gathered at the same geographical location almost never grouped together uh, phylogenetically. So it seems that um, even if we if we didn't know it previously, the, these guys seem to um, balloon frequently and they do it well. Um, so in this in this study, the American samples were not yet included because we we did not yet have them. So um, we just recently ran um, a phylogenetic network analysis in Fitzgerald just to get an idea of where the American ones would place. Um, I don't know if you can see the colors, but the, the American ones basically group here on the right, far away from, from all, all other samples. 
And so far, um, it looks as though we will not be able to really um, say anything much about where these, these guys came from. Um, and of course, the solution to this is to um, have a more thorough sampling of the Asian populations and maybe try an, an analysis like this again using much, um, a much wider sampling. Um, but in the other species, in Ephelopilipus, we did recover genetic structure um, for uh, the same genetic clusters seem to be um, um, present in the species, or at least in the, in the included individuals. Um, the two larger clades um, are characterized each by one of these four genetic clusters, while the other two are more or less confined to the uh, basalmost clade up at the top. And those individuals were actually collected in Okinawa, um, in Japan, and seem to be genetically distinct in some way. Um, also, if you look at the terminals with a black star, you can see them. Those are the melanic females, and they are spread out throughout the phylogeny. So this basically um, gives you know, support for the, for the um, hypothesis that the melanic ones are a separate species. So if we plot these, um, this genetic structure onto a map, we can actually um, not really um, come up with any sort of a geographic pattern. It, it's the, a, a very obvious um, geographic pattern just isn't, isn't present. Um, so we are currently thinking um, about this in the context of um, paleoclimatic and paleogeologic factors that could influence um, the, the, geologic, the, the, the geographical distribution of these uh, haplotypes, um, especially the fluctuation in the extent of rainforests um, during the quaternary glacial and interglacial period. Um, so then we, we also ran the same um, bi uh, biogenetic network um, analysis on, on these guys, and again, it is definitely corroborated that the, uh, the Okinawan specimens are different in some way. They, they really stand out um, over there on, on the right. So we also don't know what's going on here yet, but that's definitely something that's worth looking into as well. Um, so just to recap the main conclusions, so we have found the Gondwanan origin of methylids, um either um, in modern-day Australasia or in, or in the Malaya or, or both. Um, both the giant golden orb weaver and the Jura spider seem to be very um, frequent and very good ballooners. They maintain gene flow across very large um, areas. And um, while the, the, the giant orb weaver does show some genetical structure, it has no clear um, relationship to, to geography. And lastly, to clarify where the American Jura spiders came from, we need to um, sample more and wider and try this again. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone who has been involved in this research, research in any way. Um, and of course, thank you for listening. Hi, uh, you know, very nice talk. I really like it. I would like to ask you uh, why to consider uh, this group has a family if it's very within RNA and that will make RNA polyphyletic. And um, or do you think that um, taxonomic classification should not create and choose the work with one of my little groups. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm not a systematist or a taxonomist, um, so actually that, I understand your question, but um, that was really not um, a part of, of, of the question here, or, or uh, you know, uh, a part of the study. And I actually think that, um, the placement of this family or whatever does not really affect the analysis that, that we did. So regardless of its rank, 
um, the analysis here would remain the same. So that was all that was important to me in these studies. So that's all I can say. Oh, nice work, Eva. Um, I just have a question regarding the, the biogeography. I mean, I don't see on the trees um, paraplectanoides, which, as you know, is from Australia, Tasmania, and so on, which was first shown by Sharp et al. Uh, with Sanger sequencing data, resisted group of, of methylines, and something that was just corroborated with uh, transcriptomes and later on. With, um, with uses, and I know you are not a systematist, but as a biogeographer, it seems to me that it would make a lot of sense to, uh, you know, consider that the sister group of nephilines is an Australian uh, uh, monotypic genus, um, and that that should actually play some role in, you know, uh, hypothesizing the, the origin. Thank you. Um, yeah, if, if we. If you would that, uh, add that to the, to the phylogeny, that um, I mean, the result would remain more or less the same, except that of course there would be a higher, um, so a stronger support for the um, Australian um, content. As the so I asked you the same question in Christchurch. So my question is, what, why is not paraplectinoids, you know, part of this analysis? The heart of the analysis? Or sorry. The seems to be critical, you know, whether it changes the result or not. The data had been out there, you know, the uh, classification that you had out there from CISBio mm -hmm. has been rebutted in CISBio as well. So it, it seems to me that ignoring that doesn't help. But, but the result is, is uh, completely in line with, with that, right? Because yes, but I, I, probably, I, I don't doubt that. I don't doubt that. but. You know, uh, the data are there. So, what is the justification for not having the closest relative of nephi lines in a biogeographic analysis? I mean, it seems to me, I'm not strong in biogeography, but it seems that, you know, having the closest relatives, especially when they are at hand, you know, it's important. Thank you. This analysis was actually uh, a few years old, so um, a bit before all the recent papers that you mentioned. So um, the next time we, we try this, uh, we'll reconsider that. Oh, hi, Eva. I, I have a quick question. I'm wondering if you, thank you for the nice talk. I'm wondering if you thought about with your method in the first paper, how to incorporate, because often with um, this geological evidence, there's sometimes controversy, you know, where it's uncertain when the Burma terrain broke off and things like that. Have you thought about how to incorporate that uncertainty into the type of methods that you, you did for that paper? Hmm. Yeah. I, uh, I haven't really thought about that. Uh, I think especially because we work with such large regions that are pretty easy to kind of, um, as we know the, the history more or less, the rough history. Um, so I guess it would have to, to be a, um, another multiplier, another factor in the, in the um, dispersal probability matrices. Um, but I think, um, a lot of these, these matrices are really organism specific, so I think you really have to look at the specific conditions, um, life history traits, whatever, for that organism, and then kind of devise your own way of scoring the, the factors. It might yeah. be interesting to incorporate that. Mm -hmm. Cool, thank you. I think so, the very nice talk. Uh, you mentioned the, the Burmese fossil, but there are also other fossils like in Baltic amber and Dominican amber. So, uh, how uh, are they included in the historical biogeographical part? No. Uh, uh, only this one because of its placement at the base of the of the. Just this one. Yeah. 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 Right, yeah, 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 sure, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ivan, that, uh, that was really great, uh, I really enjoyed it. 
Um, just to shift gears a little bit and, and ask you something about the other part of the talk <laughs> of the, the federal geography. Um, uh, there were actually very interesting results, especially for, for Nephilim. You know, I mean, you could see some structure, but then that doesn't seem to match the, the, the geography. Uh, you were suggesting that uh, maybe an explanation for that would be some cycles in the expansion, contraction, um, uh, forests or tropical uh, areas, or whatever is the preferred habitat of these, of these guys. Uh, have you actually kind of like thinking about a particular way to test that, maybe using some kind of ABC modeling approach or? Not yet, no. Um, but this result has been um, the analysis has been carried out relatively recently, so we are very much open to um, any methodological ideas about how to make sense of this. Uh, so not, not yet, but yeah. No more questions. Okay. Thank you very much. Now I'm, I'm really happy to get to introduce Dr. Darko Kotaras. Uh, Darko received his bachelor's and also his, ma his, bas his bachelor in biology and then his master's in ecology and evolution, studying Evo Devo, uh, from, both from the same institution at the Universidad de Chile. And then for his doctorate, he was sponsored by a Fulbright Fellowship and he was based at the University of California, Berkeley where we overlapped as lab members uh, under the supervision of Rosemary Gillespie. And his focus for his doctorate was the temporal dynamic of adaptive radiation of tetragnathus spiders in Hawaii. Then after that, he was a postdoc split between the California Academy of Sciences and the University of California, Santa Cruz, where he was working on improving ancient DNA methods for museum specimens. In the last few years, he's taught several courses at the, for the Organization for Tropical Studies in Costa Rica. And currently, he is a humble postdoctoral fellow at the Sankenberg Museum, working with Peter Yeager. And he's also a research associate at the California Academy of Sciences. And today, he'll be talking to us about insights about diversification processes from spiders of the Pacific. Thank you, Anna, for that nice introduction. And thank you to the organizers of this meeting for inviting me and supporting my participation. So today, uh, what I would like to do is, instead of diving deep into one project, really tell you a collection of results that I've been gathering with other colleagues over the course of several years in the broad topic of diversification. So my idea is to put on a big picture all this evidence and see how all of these examples help us to support and refute ideas of how diversity happens or it's created. And I would like to emphasize that these are really examples, that are like these are one little grain of sand and the work that we all do on different study systems, on different geographies, all of that adds up to really support or refute these hypotheses. So diversification happens at different levels of the biological complexity and sometimes what creates diversification at one level does not relate at all with what's created at another one. That's why, for example, you can have lots of species, but lots of population variability, like on these uh, Ophaga pumilio uh, frogs, but there's still one species. In other cases, you can have very, you can have lots of genomic variability, but still one species. So really, you need to address all these levels with different views. Now, why spiders and why islands? to address this topic. Well, first, islands, due to their simplified characteristics, are really privileged systems to isolate explanatory variables. And spiders are really good on getting to islands. They disperse really well, and they're very good as early colonizers. And this, yeah, and, and I would like to illustrate this 
just also as a way to show how islands have played like a like a role, like an important uh, place into understanding island diversification, but also how museums are important. So here is a picture of the experimental test of the theory of island biogeography. And you can see it's near key E7. And in MCC, you can find actually specimens from that study. So I think when I found this specimen at MCC, I thought this is like historic. So I, I think that's a, I think that's very cool. So conceptually, I would like to start talking about the idea of adaptive radiation, which I think is one of the most spectacular phenomena in evolution. It corresponds to the rapid diversification of a large number of species on a very short period of time. And associated to this diversification is the occupation of different ecological niches. Now, when we say fast, it means that it's kind of difficult to really and like disentangle how this diversification process, this speciation event happen. The privileged place to study that is the Hawaiian archipelago. This is an archipelago in the tropical Pacific of volcanic islands that very elegantly in this chrono sequence of islands show us basically the life history of a volcanic island from a very young age on the big island to a very old age on Kauai. Now, this chrono sequence arrangement is not only telling us about the diversification, of, no, it's not telling us only about the history of the geology, but also it has been used to understand community assembly process as well as lineage evolution. Regarding with diversification on spiders, in Hawaii we have several adaptive and non-adaptive radiations. As an adaptive radiation, we have the Ariamnes, the spiders, and as a non-adaptive, the Orson Welles spiders. But now I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the Tetranata Hawaiian adaptive radiation, which represents 11% of the world's diversity of this genera, which has about 324 species. So something really unique is happening on the Hawaiian islands. Within this diversification radiation, there are two clades. One of them is the spiny leg clade. In this clade, there is the convergent evolution of four different ecomorphologies on different islands and volcanoes throughout the archipelago. You never find two species of the same ecomorph in the same place, except on the volcano of Haleakala in Maui, in the Middle Age island of Maui, where you find three species of the green ecomorphology occurring right next to each other. So, yeah, so what does it tell us about the temporal dynamic of diversification? Why this intermediate situation happens on the, in, in the Middle Age island and not on the old island or the young island? So to look deeper into that, we studied the population structure of these three species, and here is a cartoon representation of their distribution. You can see in Haleakala, all of them, and then in other islands, all volcanoes, all the population. We did extensive sampling, especially in Maui, and then created an excellent capture array from a transcriptome. This is before you see it. <laughs> and we produce about 120 uh, genome libraries for a capture. This is a PCA using a uh, side frequency spectrum. But the most important result here for the talk today happens down here, which basically is telling us that we have one species, white camoy, co occurring with the other two species. That's a novel finding. Uh, after seeing this situation, because they're closely related species with the same ecology, we ask, well, maybe they are actually hybridizing. This is not a complete diversification event, a speciation event, sorry. But when we look at the two populations where this co-occurrence happens, for the individuals present there, there's no trace of hybridization. This is also supported by the PCA. Well, then we thought that maybe using such frequency spectrum could add some sort of uh, biases, so we call the SNPs and building a um, split three, like a phylogenetic network, we again do not find any trace of hybridization. So that means that the species boundaries are already well established. So how does it relate with the beginning of an adaptive radiation? And this is kind of the idea that we have currently about how radiation gets started. Imagine that you have an island with a volcano with one species. Because it's a volcanic island, other volcanoes will appear, the species will be able to disperse, and we have four populations. And with time, they turn into four allopatric species. As the island gets even older, some of these species will be able to move around, come into secondary contact, and some of their native branches might disappear due to subsidence, erosion, or landslides. This is the situation that we found with the green tetranata. And we think that the next step will be some type of character displacement at a macroevolutionary level, which will turn into different ecomorphologies. So the species will start having a different ecology. Now, this idea that a low is necessary at the beginning of an adaptive radiation has been in the literature for more than 10 years. 
And now more and more of the classic study systems for alterations are showing that this is the case. We found that also on the anoles in the Caribbean and the cichlids in Africa. Not as a surprise, adaptive radiations tend to occur in large complex archipelagos. That makes sense because the size and complexity allow this initial step of allotropy. So what does it happen on a small isolated island? In other words, can ecological speciation evolve without a geographic barrier? If we're a good scientist, we keep all variables constant, but we, we change the one that we're going to study. In this case, we go from a large archipelago, highly isolated, to a small island, highly isolated. This is Rapa Nui. Rapa Nui is well-renowned because of the, the culture that evolved here with all these moais. And conveniently enough, has an endemic species of Tetranata, Tetranata pascae. Now, inconveniently enough, this species has not been seen since 1924, when it was originally described. It's not really a surprise because Easter Island is also well known because of the ecological collapse that happened on the island, followed the complete, almost complete deforestation. So most likely, the species could be extinct. Uh, a few years ago, with colleagues from Chile, we decided to go to the island to look for this species. Of course, that's kind of like a risky thing, so we also did like a broad survey of all the arachnids and terrestrial arthropods. We found about 60 records. We found specimens that have been used for more species-focused studies. And we did find one tetragnata. Now, this tetragnata was not Pascae basal morphology, was not Nitans, another common Pacific species, was something else. So that brings us to another question. What is the relationship between this endemic Pascae and this other thing? By the time I was doing this work, these three pages where everything was known about Chilean tetragnata. So morphology made it very difficult to really identify what we have in our hands. The situation had changed last year with Pedro Castaneda's review. But at that time, this was everything. So when you don't have data in the literature, you go to museums. And where the types of Pascal should have been was the Natural History Museum in Paris, where I couldn't find them. Then, by random chance, I did find specimens of Pascal in Natural History Museum in London. Around that time, I was a postdoc between Calacarima and Mrs. Santa Cruz, improving these ancient DNA methods for museum specimens. These methods were later applied also in flying research successfully, and of course, I applied them for the tetragnata. Uh, OK, sorry, this first should be this one. Yeah. So we build a phylogeny, including museum specimens and also fresh collected specimens with shotgun sequencing. And then with iterative mapping, we create partial mitochondrial genomes. We run maximum likelihood and base and trees. And we got these two topologies. And they differ basically on the type of filtering we do uh, regarding the coverage required and the agreement per site. Both topologies, for the purpose of this question, are more or less the same. So I will just talk with the one that has more species, which will be this one. So here we have the answer to the question about the relationship between the current tetragnata and Pascal. They are not closely related. The current tetragnata is actually nested on a clay with only American species and with a zero branch length with tetragnata rivet, which is a species from Ecuador. Interestingly, this molecular study brought me back to the specimens and morphology and realized that, yes, they are actually the same thing. Tetranata rivetti has been synonymized and moved to another species, but for the purpose of biogeography, what really matters is the, the origin of the specimen, which in this case is the American continent. In the case of Pascaia, we have a species sister to a Chinese specimen of Nitas and also in a clay with Tetranata mua from Tahiti, so it's an Asia-Pacific species, which biogeographically makes sense. In 2018, I came back to the island to look for Pascal again, and I couldn't find it. So in collaboration with Island Conservation, we filed a documentation to declare the species extinct based on the, on the regulations of the Ministry of Environment of Chile. Now, I don't want to just talk about extinctions. If you are in Rapa Nui, there is Motumotirohila, the closest island. Uh, this is also another high peak of the Easter uh, Seamount chain. It's very little, 0.15 hectares. And this island is home of one endemic Ariadna species, Ariadna motumotirohila, which was described in collaboration with colleagues from Easter Island National Park and from Butantan in Brazil. This species morphologically is more closely related to the Ariadnas from Hawaii and Marquesas instead of the ones from South America, which means that probably is a, a, a natural colonization event. Interesting enough, there's no Ariadna or suggested in the sky for Easter Island. So most likely, this is a surviving species from a peripheral island. We cannot prove that, of course. 
But it really reminds situations such as the, Lord, the giant stick exit for Lord Howe Island, which went extinct in the Lord Howe, but survived in both pyramids. Okay, all these extinctions really prevented to answer the question about diversification on the small islands. So to answer that one, I'm going to take you up north to Isla del Coco. This is also a volcanic island from Costa Rica. It's 23 kilometers square, so relatively small. It's extremely, extremely wet, seven meters of rain per year, and very lush and beautiful. And it has this one little finch. This is the only Darwin finch that lives outside the Galapagos. It has a very generalized beak in, in contrast to the ones in Galapagos. But it has behaviors representing three or four families of birds, extremely diversified at the behavioral level. And that gives us a hint of what we're asking for. Now, in Cocos, there is one when the Garda species, when the Garda Galapagensis, when the Garda is a genus of the somatic, very small one, 15 species of tropical distribution. Some colleagues in China have been describing a couple of new species recently, but has not been revised since 86. The cine, one of the cinnabomorphies of the genus is this very modified, highly modified web with an horizontal line and vertical sticky lines that attach to water. In 1989, Professor William Everhart discovered that when the Garda Galapagensis actually has three different types of web. The water one, one that is the same but going into dry land, the, the, the land web, and one that is in the vegetation. This situation really makes me wonder. Are these three different webs really representing a tiny adaptive radiation of three species that have diversified in the ecological axis of the web? Or we are in the presence of a very, um, of an exceptional interspecific, interspecific behavioral plasticity. In order to test that, I took a population genetic approach. If we collect specimens from the three types of web, and then we do some type of genomic analysis, and we plot them on a PCA, if they separate the cluster of the specimens by web type, then probably is the first option. Now, if they don't, if they create like a, an homogeneous distribution, probably is one species with a lot of behavioral plasticity. Now, a challenge of this is that the species has not been recorded since 1989. So I was really afraid that going to this island would be kind of the same story as with Pascal. Luckily, it wasn't. And here's a water web. Here's a dry land web. Here's an aerial web. All of them right next to each other just like on an adaptive radiation. So to the genomic work that we did was based on a dd uh, approach. We created 140 dd uh, libraries for specimens of the three types of web, and then analyzed the data using a docent, uh, that's the name of the pipeline, a docent pipeline. So what do you think is gonna happen? Three species or one single species? So I think the, the result is pretty self-explanatory. There's no population structure defined by web type. And if we look at the same uh, situation per collection size, also there's no population structure. If we look at geographic population structure, there's no population structure. FST's values here are 0, 0.00 something. So basically, one species that was almost a panemictic population. Second alternative, Favor, and we're talking about one very plastic, one species with a lot of plastic behavior. Okay, that's a proxy from genomics. If this is true, we should be able to test that with, a, a, with behavioral experiments in the field. So the experiments that I set out to do after this result was to do basically reciprocal transplants. What happens if you take one individual from a water web and put it up on the vegetation and the other way around? Would they be able to make a different type of web? or well, they will have some sort of preference. We don't have evidence that it could be genetic, but there could be still imprinting or something like that. So the experiment was basically go back to the island and then do reciprocal transplants. And I just want to indulge myself, pointing out that I need to go back two times because the place is extremely rainy and the first time literally it washed out all my experiments. And this is a little thing that you don't get to say when you're writing the papers, but in getting the data, and I know all of you will have similar stories, getting the data makes it so hard. So just please think about that when you look at this one slide of results. Um, yeah, so the spiders were marked with a nail polish, and I, after reintroduced them, came back five times in a period of 48 hours. Uh, this is one of the results, the first observation. The other four observations have the same pattern. And the pattern is that basically in controls and translocation, there's no statistical difference. So the spiders, after the experimental uh, 
per turbans are able to steam some of them aerial webs, some of them water webs. The same thing happened for water webs and aerial webs. In this case, this null result is great because that means that there is plasticity, and we have shown that with an experiment, not only with the genomic proxy. Now, if we conceptualize this situation, basically, it already it, this version has already been conceptualized and by the idea of Professor Mary Jane West Everhart called interspecific adaptive radiation. In the same way that we have an adaptive radiation where uh, interspecific competition drives these differences in ecology, if you have a place that is very small and there's no allopathy, you will have the same driving force but now acting at the behavior level to reduce intra-specific competition. The finch does the same, and two cone snails have something very similar, but in these two cases, there's no evidence of niche partition, but niche expansion. I just talked about uh, behavioral plasticity but if, and polymorphism, but if we talk about polymorphism, there are also genetically based polymorphisms. And what better example than the happy face spider from Hawaii? There's also other examples like the Gastrocantha, in the Caribbean, Nephilas in Southeast Asia. In the case of the Hawaiian happy face spider, it's a species, single species, with a wide variety of morphs. Now, this, more, this situation is not unique to the happy face. Actually, very recently, the group of Michele Leo have found other species that also have polymorphism within the same archipelago, and they're all closely related. Now, if you go to the west coast of North America, Stellinum californicum, extending from Northern California to British Columbia, also with color variation in the same genus. And in the forests of Northern Europe, you have Inoplonica ovata, also with color variation. Now, there is another member of this polymorphic team in the Teridide, and this, is, this was found originally in the Juan Fernandez archipelago, which is a group of volcanic islands off the coast of central Chile, humid habitat, and here you can find Selvigiela albumitata, which has the same design of the famous happy face morph. Now, it is not only converging in this one, it actually converges in the fact that it's polymorphic, and the most common morph is also the most common in happy face, in Inoplonata, in Californicum, and so on. Sequencing the usual suspect, we were able to show that all these species with color variation are independent cases and they are over-distributed within the Teridia phylogeny. Interestingly, if you map that, if you look at that on the map, at least these four examples, they all occur in what I will call temperate rainforest. In the case of Hawaii, it's tropical, but it's at high elevation. All these spiders live in the underside of the leaves, so something, some type of selection pressure is triggered that within Teridia, these polymorphisms evolve. Currently, I am working uh, at Senckenberg, Studying deeper into the group of Celtichella, I'm doing a taxonomic revision, genome assembly, and phylogenomic reconstruction. This group is restricted to the temperate rainforest of Western South America, mostly in Chile, but also in Argentina. So, to finish things up, I promise about insights. What are the insights that we get from all these examples? We have an event of island colonization. Many things could happen. Today we talk about two of them. One of them is parallel evolution due to similar selective pressures, such as in the ecomorphs of Hawaiian tetragnata or the polymorphic teridium. There also could be ecological releases due to niche expansion and then niche partition. If this happens in the context of allopatry, due to some type of macroevolutionary character displacement, you have adaptive radiation, like in the Hawaiian tetragnata. Now, if that happens in sympathy, behavior mediated by behavior polymorphisms, there is an interspecific adaptive radiation. Now, all of this could be really obscure due to extinction, like what happened with the Tetranata Pascal. But if you're lucky and there are museum specimens and you have methodologies like ancient DNA, you can get some information, as well as if you can get access to the specimens from refugia, such as peripheral islands, caves, or cliffs. So I would like to finish thanking a large, large number of people. This work has been done, and many people have contributed to this. All of them are properly mentioned in the papers, but I would like to particularly highlight my mentors and professors who have hosted me on their labs. I'm very grateful for the different forms of support, as well as the intellectual freedom to pursue these questions. All this work also couldn't be done without the protection of the environment, and many private and governmental agencies in all these countries have been responsible to that, and I'm very grateful for them allowing me to do this work. Also, as we all know, biodiversity research could not be done without museums, curators, and curatorial assistants. So thank you to all of them. Here I'm just mentioning the museums mentioned on the talk, but I have been at this way more. 
also, I couldn't be, I couldn't do this work without many, many fun sources of funding here. I'm just mentioning the ones that have supported me for the longest period of time, but the all institutions are very grateful. And finally, thank you for your attention. And I'll be very happy to answer any questions. We have about three minutes for questions. Questions? Yes. Is this the first well-documented case of a spider extinction, or do you know of no, the, the, the red list of the IUCN, there are three cases of spiders on the Seychelles, and this one is not yet in the IUCN. Uh, these three spiders on the Seychelles, I think two of them are sporacids, and the third one is also a large spider. I would say the first of tiny one. Uh, nice talk. Um, as you mentioned, or you were just mentioning the IUCN. Can you maybe just comment on um, the current status of like arachnid representation on the IUCN and what you think steps could be taken to improve that? Well, I I know there are people working towards that, towards adding more information on, on those lists. Uh, I don't know if someone here at the conference is heavily involved in that, but in previous conferences, I, I even have seen workshops on that topic. So it is something that is being increase in terms of adding species. Thanks, Marco. That was, that was really, um, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, I was, actually, I was so interested on this, uh, this idea um, of, of, well, at the very end, when you summarize, you know, kind of like your, your perspective about the, the adaptive radiation, but yeah, you have this kind of like two, different ways, you know, for adaptive I mean, I understand that's what you mean. It's these six different ways you can actually generate uh, this uh, diversification, you know, in, a, in, a, in the scenario of, a, of an adaptive radiation, of an island adaptive radiation. Uh, I really enjoy the fact that, that you make the difference uh, between diversification and the mode of speciation. Because I think there's always a misconception that adaptive radiation involves some kind of ecological speciation, and this is not necessarily the case. In fact, as you mentioned, most of the data points towards allopatric speciation followed by secondary overlap and, the, and then some kind of interspecific competition. But I'd like you to elaborate a little bit about these kind of like two alternative ways. So what, when you refer to parallel evolution, I mean, this is the other way, I mean, what do you refer to? I mean, I mean how do you look at this one? Or is it just one, another feature of adaptive uh, radiation? No, 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 I just summarize that this is about radiation and this is another phenomenon. It's different. Now, and here I would like to add, and I, it's not in the chart because I didn't talk about it, my own examples of this, is that follow island colonization, if you skip niche expansion and you, you go through a low trip, then there is non-adaptive radiation. And this is not here, but we can also add a, a chart here. But the parallel evolution is, yeah, it's not part of this. It's conceptual. Yeah. Last question. Okay, uh, very nice talk, Darko. And um, I actually wonder whether you're going to investigate the drivers of the polymorphism in the coloration of the 38 spiders. Yes, that, that's why we're doing genome sequencing. And do you have an idea what could be the driver? The driver or the yeah, the selection? No, the selection pressure. Yes, so the, there is one hypothesis that has been already published by Geoff Oxford and Rosie Gillespie and another third author. And the idea is that it is some type of mechanism to predator avoidance. So, so, so birds, we have some sort of search image, and if you deviate from that search image, that gives you some selective advantage. That's one alternative. And the other one is that the green morph gives a selective advantage because it's more cryptic. But, but these are ideas with this computer simulation supporting the first one. But there's no, there's, currently there's no data or, or the experimental tests. Have a round of applause for both of our speakers.